Okay, well, there's a nice screen here, so I might as well use this. Um, so really happy to be here, uh, and I don't have a prepared speech. I've seen that there's already like 36 uh, questions on Slido, which means that we will not have time to go through all of them. Uh, so please, um, I don't know, press like or lobby or something so that uh, your questions flow to the top. Uh, and since we already <coughs> have the projection um, here, I, I would like to just switch to Slido and start answering your questions. Uh, now feel free to interrupt me anytime so that if you want to ask a follow-up question or just something that you know, springs to your mind or whatever, uh, just raise your hand and interrupt me or don't raise your hand, just interrupt me uh, so that we can have a free-flowing conversation. And without further ado, uh, let's switch to the Slido screen uh, and then we can have a... Super town hall here. Okay, great. Right, so um, the first question, top ranked uh, from Kinda. <laughs> <laughs> so would you like to re read it yourself? Yeah, for sure, for sure. Um, so Minister, how do you, so we all know you've done a lot of, uh, work on a lot of cool things. How do you find time to absorb all the information you read and synthesize all of it to come up with new ideas? Like what do you read, books, news sources, any approaches you can share with us? Yeah, so uh, the, the trick I found uh, to absorb all the information is to not interrupt them while I read it. Uh, because if I debate uh, with the author uh, whenever I read something, then I have a very short context window. Uh, but if I don't uh, disrupt the author, I often just read before going to bed uh, and just flipping through uh, or scrolling through a long like 100k context uh, thing. Uh, and then uh, it just uh, leaves some visual memory. I have some ideas of what it's talking about, but I, I seldom read it aloud in my mind so that I won't have a debate uh, with the author, and then I go to sleep. Uh, I always, always make sure to sleep for eight full hours uh, a day. Uh, it could be like four hours and four hours, but uh, in some eight, eight hours a day. And then when I wake up, I usually have a <coughs> like more holistic view of what I just read before uh, going to bed. Uh, and then I start to have a debate or a synthesis or whatever with that holistic view. Uh, and I actively seek out uh, the viewpoints that's different from my own. So so that the idea is to take all the sides uh, if uh, during a policy conversation and so on I see some sides arguments and I'm like like how would anyone come up with that sort of argument I always assume it's my fault uh, not that person's fault and I make sure to allocate time uh, to spend some time with them uh, to for example if it's uh, from a particular uh, vicinity of a district or something I actually go there and spend a few days uh, and do a ethnographic or just hang out uh, with that uh, community until I can actually argue from their perspective and so I found that this kind of like active seeking out uh, diverse viewpoints <clears throat> is much more uh, important than just reading from any books or news sources and so on because uh, the frame upon which that I understand those ideas must be grounded uh, into the lived experience of particular communities. So um, by traveling across Taiwan and indeed across the world, I think this is more empowering people closest to the pain and let them uh, guide me uh, on my way of understanding. And as far as synthesis, usually it's always motivated by some crisis, like some uh, clear urgency uh, for clarity, whether it's pandemic, whether it's infodemic, whether it's this, um, you know, uh, transformative technologies like AI and so on. Usually there is this uh, rush to find clarity of what we're actually uh, up to, and that is the motivating factor in synthesizing uh, understanding for me, so that I have to consider uh, viewpoints from various different uh, live experiences. Does that work for you? Uh, I think there's two hands. You first. Oh, I was just curious. What? Yes. What do you mean by infodemic? I'm sorry. What What do you uh, mean by infodemic? Yeah. I think it's defined by WHO as uh, too much information uh, around pandemic so that um, nobody can actually understand the science. Uh, behind uh, the epidemiology, uh, behind the, the pandemic, simply because for each and every um, issue, like mask using or contact tracing or whatever, uh, there's just 
too much information on all sorts of uh, different perspectives, uh, and it's very difficult then to uh, make an informed judgment because the informed part seems to go on and on and on uh, during the pandemic. Uh, and so to overcome the infodemic, one of the main ideas is just to quickly converge to something that we can all live with. For example, earlier on, uh, around mask use, uh, turns out that between the spectrum of people thinking masks are, I don't know, 5G antenna or something, uh, and um, right, embedded something, uh, uh, versus like just wear a mask and no question asked, uh, there's generally a rough consensus on uh, if you wear a mask, you're less likely to touch your mouth with your unwashed hand. Uh, and, and that's like the rough consensus. Uh, and so um, the rough consensus are like catalysts. When people see that it is actually possible to agree on something, Thing. The infodemic become more manageable because then uh, people just grow their different adapters uh, around the same uh, shared kernel of rough consensus. But if there's no rough consensus that's uh, promoted by the government or the, any of the social sector people, then uh, people naturally polarize or diverge uh, given the current generation of social media algorithms. So I think that is one of the reasons why we need to take all the slides and not uh, make anyone feel left out when we push out the, those uh, rough consensus communication material. Thank you. Hope that makes sense. Um, any other hands? Yes, here. When you mentioned that while you were reading, yes. you wanted to wait, or okay. you debated with the author, yes. are you referring to your mental process of yes. trying to combat uh, or challenge what they're reading? Yes, exactly, exactly. So um, it's basically just uh, suspending judgment. Right, so sometimes you will read something from an author and you disagree with that one sentence and there's some urge to at least highlight that line or tweet about it or something, right? Uh, but if you um, do that, then it's less likely that you will fuse with the horizon, with the perspective of that author. Only by like thoroughly uh, entertaining that position uh, can you actually form a truly informed uh, judgment on the whole book, not just that one sentence. Hope that makes sense. Uh, was another hand? Yes, here. How do you arrive at rough consensus? Is it something that solely happens over time and presenting diverging viewpoints? Or are there faster ways to get there? Okay, uh, like algorithmic ways to get there? Yes, <laughs> actually. Um, so, um, there, there's two sides of this question. Uh, one is that, is there particular designs of a space that makes it possible for people to signal something that's more like a rough consensus. So Slido is actually a crude uh, <coughs> approximation right, of a rough consensus process. If a question uh, receives a lot of likes from people in the room, we know that this question is important and we need to focus more time on that question. So while it's not rough consensus per se, it's a candidate rough consensus uh, that we would like to spend more time on. Compare that to other uh, engagement uh, metrics, like instead of measuring the collective um, input, uh, if we just um, make, make the engagement counting and so on, um, individual, like uh, if we measure how many seconds one spends on reading one question and so on, that's another possible metric. But that is uh, less uh, social, that is to say it's uh, harder to share that sort of metric. It becomes very individualized, very personalized. And if we optimize for that sort of metric, which may also be important, then it's harder to share that as a reflection of the community back to the community. So it depends on what kind of signal you highlight from the group conversation back to the group. Now, uh, in addition to Slido, uh, we have uh, tools like Polis and so on, uh, which um, highlights instead the, the rough consensus in a way that it first highlights the polarization like around one particular uh, topic, you may see two clusters, three clusters that have different views on this particular thing. But then uh, it also highlights the bridging statements, that is to say, the statements that are more likely to be upvoted by people uh, across the different ideological spectrum. And uh, the Twitter community notes uh, uses the same algorithm, <coughs> and the algorithm is open source. Uh, and so whether you um, uplift the bridging narratives or whether you uplift uh, uh, the individualized polarized narratives is an algorithmic choice, and uh, that is the dif differentiation between a pro social space and a anti social space. As a follow up question to that, then, <clears throat> are there like issues in terms of onboarding users onto technology where those rough consensus can happen? So, for example, Twitter has like a, like at least in the Twitter, like 
universe that I am, it's very biased towards like technology, and like Reddit is very biased towards certain kinds of users, and not necessarily representative of the population. So have you encountered issues with, in terms of onboarding people onto those platforms? Yeah, definitely. So as I mentioned, there, there's no um, natural um, tribe, right? No natural sub-community uh, that you can say, oh, this community is the bridge maker and everyone else need to listen to this subreddit, right? It, it, it's not something that emerges uh, from the subreddit uh, framework or uh, corners of Twitter. However, uh, there are algorithms, as I mentioned, like uh, community nodes, uh, that for every particular issue, like a trending tweet, that is lacking context. Uh, the fact-checking process, uh, kind of like jury duty, I guess, uh, motivates the mind to think beyond <clears throat> their immediate tribe. Uh, and so by participating in the fact-checking, this inoculates the mind uh, against disinformation or outrage because that process basically compels someone to work like a journalist. Uh, the journalist that to look at different sources, uh, compare the sources, rank the sources in terms of uh, rough consensus, authenticity, and things like that. And it's not the product, not the check facts, not the community note that's posted that inoculates uh, the mind against the infodemic. It's a process of going through that fact-finding uh, process, which is why we emphasize that in our basic education, uh, what we call uh, competence instead of literacy uh, in education, because we found that when the um, like uh, high school students fact check the three presidential candidates as they're having a debate, uh, they're much less likely uh, to be um, captured by the outrage, rhetorics, polarizing rhetorics, and so on. So I think it's this process that is itself a onboarding. If you do it as an exercise, then it loses the, the potential because uh, what motivates people intrinsically is that their outputs, this process, actually uh, results in a product that has a public good uh, impact that it informs people after them that encounter this information. So this like public good um, benefit uh, impulse, right? I do this just to also educate uh, my classmates and so on. This is a part of the process. You cannot just take that out and say, uh, let's do some fact-checking exercises. Thank you. I'm gonna pass along the mic just so, okay. well, when people ask follow-up questions, just so we can record the questions yes, as well. Of course. Uh, you, you pick. Uh, not sure. <laughs> Uh, thank you. Uh, so you mentioned that picking whether to, to focus more on these like smaller groups or the bridging narratives, that's an algorithmic choice. Uh, and in my experience with social media, it seems really easy to get into a pocket. Uh, so how can we influence these social media companies and other companies that are creating this like public narrative to uh, just give more focus to the bridging narratives? Um, we, as in like Googlers, or oh, we, just, as in <laughs> just social media users. Like <laughs> okay, yeah. right. I, I'm like, yeah, you can deny API access. <laughs> 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 So, uh, like two ideas come to mind. Uh, one is that simply to, to spend time more uh, on the corners of the internet that has this kind of uh, plural or bridge making potentials, like spend more time on community nets, spend more time on police like conversations. And you can actually always set up a meta conversation on top of the existing like Twitter conversation that uh, with the explicit lane uh, to find uh, such bridges. And we've done uh, quite a few. There's a, a demo by uh, Talk to the City. Uh, uh, that just looks at all Twitter conversations around generative AI, I think around March, uh, and then uh, builds a visualization of the clusters. And then you can click into each cluster, and using a language model, you can have a further conversation with that cluster. Uh, and the language model will just nudge you uh, to find the bridging narratives and so on. So uh, on, my, on my Twitter, uh, the, the latest tweet is a paper uh, that talks about how Anthropic worked with Polis to, to do such bridge making thing with their long context uh, language. Which model. So there are already this kind of bridge making like meta frameworks you can apply on existing polarized conversations uh, and just invite those polarized conversations into this meta conversation. I think it's a, a powerful uh, like segue right into bridge making. That's why. And the, the second thing I think is just to uh, make sure that when we engage uh, with each other uh, across social media and so on. Um, do it with the intention of bringing that person into a pro-social space. And if there's no like meta layer for that particular engagement and so on, something that I usually do uh, is just uh, just to paste with a link 
and say that in order, like if I pay on Facebook, that we're having a conversation about Uber's impact on, on Taiwanese transportation and economy. Uh, instead of engaging anyone on Facebook, on Facebook's terms, I would just say, oh, here is a police conversation on Taiwan here. And in order to uh, for, uh, for have your voice counted by policymakers, uh, leave your comments here, not there. Right. So it, it's like um, during WebEx calls or things like that, I can say, uh, just leave your comments on Slido, not on the chat room. <laughs> because on the chat room, there's no way to press like at a time. Uh, but on Slido, it's much easier. So just keep redirecting people to the pro-social space. Thank you. Uh, yes. Actually, uh, can can I delegate the like picking which uh, person to next speak? Has to be. Oh, uh, sure. <laughs> okay, yeah, uh, for sure. Um, so, so you, you have to. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I was wondering, um, what role do you think creativity and divergent thinking play in helping create a pro-social space? Uh, creative thinking and what? Uh, di divergent thinking, like... Divergent thinking. Ah, okay, like not convergent thinking, like exploratory yeah. thinking. Yeah. <clears throat> um, that's a great question. Um, I, I think bridging narratives takes more creativity than uh, perspective takes uh, that uh, just reinforce existing stereotypes and so on. Uh, so I think it needs to be um, recognized as such. Like when we say that let's create a bridging narrative or let's say uh, we will have a face-to-face -face meeting with policymakers, multiple stakeholders, honoring only, the, for example, the top 10 uh, bridging narratives or top voted side questions uh, as the agenda. We need to imbue <coughs> those bridging narrative makers with agenda setting powers by um, at least taking those bridges as narratives uh, that we start with a, a serious conversation with, but also inviting people who create those uh, bridging narratives to the table, to the multi-stakeholder meeting and so on. So I think there needs to be uh, social um, incentives for people to engage in that sort of creativity because it's a, a classic public good, right? People who make bridging narratives, who make um, those uh, investigative fact checks and so on, they benefit like everybody involved, but there's very little for them themselves uh, in, in terms of immediate incentive in, uh, well, other than just to feel that they've uh, created a breakthrough, which is uh, of course already very powerful, but if we want to couple that with an external incentive, it's usually just to empower them, empower their voices, lifting their voices to be the agenda, and inviting them on the table. And that will promote a sort of divergent thinking that also uh, explores the kind of territory in the conversation space that people, because of their stereotypes, they'll then uh, venture uh, force in their first steps. Hope that answers your question. Yeah, thank you. Let's have one more follow-up question, sure. and then we can move on to the next one. Uh, awesome. Uh, sure. location. <laughs> Hi, um, can you talk about what kinds of problems in society uh, need these sorts of mm, collective intelligence or uh, kind of consensus-based design uh, for the decision making that you're talking about? Like, what are the issues we're facing today that could benefit the most from this or are lacking this the most? Sure. Um, so as I mentioned, uh, the topics that we choose for this kind of process are the one that has an urgent need for clarity. Uh, and usually without clarity, what you have is a coordination problem <coughs> where everybody acting on their local optima end up in a place that's well not so much better than what we started with. So anything that requires coordination, collective action, and things like that are the sort of things. Uh, and it usually deals with a, um, a threat uh, vector or actor against the society that is uh, very difficult to contain uh, on a small like quarantine community and so on. So uh, actually the coronavirus is a great example because it is very difficult to contain without collective coordinated action. Uh, the same goes to uh, like polarized outrage, right? That's also something that knows no borders. Uh, and so, uh, of course, carbon dioxide. So anything that uh, is somewhat borderless, anything that travels um, quicker uh, than the kind of face-to-face -face, uh, coordination that we do, needs this kind of um, somewhat asynchronous, somewhat scalable collective intelligence process simply because 
Otherwise, we can invite the best experts in the room and have a deliberation and create something that's a fine consensus that everybody can agree with, but there's no easy way to bring that informed um, consensus back to their communities. But to counter that kind of threat uh, vector, what we need is the internal society to have a ladder of expertise, like everybody understand a little bit about this, and they can easily find somebody who knows a little bit more about this and so on. So in order to create this ladder of expertise, scalable conversation, deliberation, and so on, are required. So something that is a societal scale risk, I think, is usually uh, the kind of topic that uh, we apply this process to. Okay, perfect. Thank you so much. Uh, let's move to the next one. Uh, let's see. Right, so um, Lara says, um, Lara, I'd like to ask your question. Uh, where is, okay. Um, hi, thank you so much for being here. This is so fascinating. Um, yeah, I'm just curious about the Taiwan and the kind of model of democracy. Um, so I have a few questions here. The first one is, like, what are the benefits of doing this kind of deliberation online as opposed to in real life? You mentioned like the importance of rooting perspectives and lived experience and meeting people in person um, to understand their perspective. So how does that translate, or should that translate to online discussions? Um, the second question, I think you already addressed. What kinds of issues does this model work best yeah. for? Um, the third question is, can it scale? So for a larger country like the US, could this work? Um, could you see this working internationally, et cetera? So, yeah. Yes, um, great questions. Um, so I, I don't think in terms of like deliberating online, not in real life. I see a VTAM process as uh, something that prepares the IRL process. So as I mentioned, it's a crowdsourced agenda setting. It sets the agenda to the stakeholders in the room in a way that reflects uh, what people's true like fears and hopes are. Uh, because the people in the room, uh, usually representatives of some kind from various sectors, they have a vastly different uh, lived experience compared to the general public. But they're somewhat uh, alike, right? So I, I don't call it a monoculture, but it's more like a more monoculture compared uh, to the people they, they serve. So um, it's not that people intentionally misrepresent their constituencies, it's just that they, they can't help it, right? So I think this kind of scalable listening uh, is the most effective when it just surfaces the kind of experiences that the people who are MPs and so on uh, usually don't have uh, personal experiences with, like they may read some words that reflect something that is a bias, a injustice, and so on, but because of <coughs> structural issues, which is technically called epistemic injustice, uh, these uh, ideas often don't count as much uh, in multi-stakeholder conversations. Uh, so to pre-commit to, say, the police uh, top bridge-making statements and so on. We don't know uh, one month from now uh, what the top 10 will be, but we pre-commit to just talk about those top 10 in our face-to-face -face meetings. That is very powerful to enlist the help of the collective intelligence. So it almost always ends with uh, a IRL or a series of IRL meetings. The process doesn't work as well without the IRL meetings. So this is the first point. <coughs> the second point is that uh, well, um, online, it reaches more people closest to the pain. It's uh, logistically almost impossible to invite the most vulnerable people, the people who are most affected by technologies physically to the same room in Taipei. Uh, actually, if they live around Taipei, they're already not close to the pain, actually. So, so, so this is uh, important from a uh, like governance perspective by saying uh, broadband is a human right. And anywhere, no matter how remote in Taiwan, you have the kind of bandwidth that let you uh, watch the VTAO and live streams and uh, participate in real time and so on. And if you don't, it's, it's my fault, like literally my fault. So, <laughs> so we have like 99.9 something uh, right, coverage in terms of population uh, in 4G uh, connectivity. So, so I think this, w without this, we cannot say this is a democratic process because it will be excluding systemically everyone. Uh, so by empowering like the top of the Yushan Mountain, the most outlying uh, uh, islands and so on, with the same kind of broadband access, we can then say with good conscience that this is part of our democratic process. So, and that also answers how do you scale it to the US? You, you work on the basic first, right? So just work with, I don't know, um, 
lower its orbit providers or whatever <laughs> to provide a broadband, meaningful broadband uh, to everyone at a very affordable cost. That's one. Uh, and finally, competence education uh, in the basic education, lifelong education, to make sure that people feel that it's more important to co-create something than in an individual to individual competition to, to push somebody down and so on. And with these two, uh, bedrock, right, competence education and broadband as a human right, then you can scale whatever uh, decision making process on top of it. Yes? Oh, hello. Um, I'm Arya. Uh, so I come from a part of the, the country where internet access, like in the US, is like actually not that great. Do you have any ideas about like how to actually execute upon making sure that reasonable internet access is a thing? Like, uh, like tactically that we could literally learn from and then apply in the US? Like, do you have particular examples? Is it literally just spending time lobbying with like Verizon Wireless or is it um, like imposing some sort of tariff? Like what, what do you guys actually do? Like, I'm yes, two curious. things. First that we've had a, a universal service fund uh, so long since I was, uh, I think when I was 12, that was 1993, when I first uh, engaged uh, with the internet, already then there was this kind of, well not broadband as a human right, but at least internet access uh, as a, a human rights program in the, in the government. And we later on uh, uplifted those like public telephone programs of universal access to broadband access as well, so that every year we measure uh, how much those telecoms earn, basically. And people, uh, the companies that have above a certain threshold of revenue, they're um, compelled by the state uh, to just send money into a fund. But this fund is not a bank account, uh, it's not anything like that. It's just uh, people in rural areas, in outlying islands, uh, depending on the criteria, I think it's 10 megabits per second at, at the moment, uh, I think maybe 50 now. Uh, so uh, who cannot um, like reach this uh, threshold, they calculate how much infrastructure cost it will cost uh, to give them this kind of um, access. And then the uh, companies with uh, revenues above a certain threshold must pay for that uh, infrastructure uh, on that year. Uh, and so it's very systematic uh, and very fair uh, to the telecom providers. Uh, but now, uh, as I mentioned, we're now in the like less than 1% of the places that needs this kind of construction. It's usually because that place has no like meaningful electricity uh, or things like that. Uh, and so then it goes to the like lower layer of infrastructure, like maybe we have some solar panels there or something that's renewable there, uh, energy there, and so on. Uh, and maybe couple that with lower orbit um, satellites, which is the other thing, the other when I want to raise is uh, because um, Laura's um, satellite or orbit satellites has this property of if you can see the sky, right, you can get the signal. You don't have to have a 4G or 5G uh, tower nearby. Uh, and therefore, the energy requirement is much lower. And so because of that, uh, we are now actively in the talks uh, with, um, well, OneWeb, of course, but also other providers like Starlink and so on, so that we can include maybe next year uh, those options into universal access, uh, which may actually um, just let us to take care of the last uh, one or two percent. Yes. Let's have one more follow-up question, and then we can go to the next question. Uh, I think Andy had a question, right? Yeah. Thanks. Uh, you mentioned uh, when you were talking about Be Taiwan that you gave Taiwanese people the opportunity to talk about how they want to regulate ride-sharing industry yes. when it entered the country. Yes. Could you give us some detail about what are some of the regulations that local citizens were able to get through uh, onto government? Uh, sure. Uh, so, well, it's all on the VTOW website. Uh, but <coughs> some of the, uh, because VTOW was an experiment in 2014 15. Uh, starting 2016, uh, a lot of the VTOW inspired processes became part of the national government's uh, plan uh, after Dr. Tsai uh became the president. And so uh, we established a joint platform. Uh, Vito and only talked about like emerging technology issues. So Uber, Airbnb, uh, non-consensual intimate images, 
e-scooters, um, many things like that, right? Uh, but the joint platform is uh, because we engage the help uh, from all ministries, each and every ministry starting in 2016, if a team called participation officers or POs, uh, that's take care of building such engagement platforms uh, with the citizens on whatever issues. So on joint platform, uh, we held a series of uh, is ongoing uh, more than 100 collaborative meetings and you can look at those collaborative meetings and it's all over the place it's not just emerging technologies issues anymore uh, you have uh, the like amateur fishing rights versus professional fishing rights. Uh, you have uh, how to open up the mountains uh, for hiking while uh, respecting the indigenous cultures uh, and sustainability. Um, you have, um, I think, th there's one uh, started entirely by people younger than 18, uh, which is about uh, they not having to attend the morning pre-class uh, classes uh, every day and therefore enjoy one more hour of sleep <laughs> and they have good evidence that that actually uh, bolster their their learning proficiency by having that uh, one more hour of sleep <laughs> and so on so uh, the joint platform became even more powerful because the agenda setting in the Taiwan was still partly by the cabinet but on the joint platform anyone who collects more than 5,000 signatures online can just force a agenda on a minister and a minister must reply uh, within two months. Uh, and so the deliberation process during those two months, or two plus two is a complicated issue, uh, become much more informed because you at least have 5,000 people caring about it. That uh, becomes the seed uh, crowd, the mini public, right? Uh, although not statistically representative, but still diverse enough, uh, that informs the agenda setting. So uh, you can check out all the participation officer run collaborative meetings at, I believe, po.pdis.pdis. Cool. Uh, let's move on to the next one. Oh, there's a ledger. Uh, I will read this. Um, <laughs> so, Minister, um, we were talking about how uh, you have recently signed a letter around AI and the fact that uh, it might extinct humanity. Uh, what do you do? What do you think you should we should do in order to avoid these major societal issues in the future? How do we balance tech progress against moving too fast? Yeah, I, I mean, really, we cannot avoid major societal issues, <laughs> but we can mitigate them uh, with collective intelligence. Um, I'll just read the statement. The statement read: um, mitigating the risk of extinction from AI, like abuses should be a global priority alongside other societal scale risks such as pandemics and nuclear war. So like AI risk, pandemic, nuclear war on one tier, and climate of course above that. Uh, but I, I think it, the, the important thing about this statement is that it's a, what we call an umbrella statement, right? It uh, unites people who uh, think that AI may become like autonomous soon uh, with people like me who don't actually believe that, but do believe uh, that uh, abuses, misuses of AI will uh, decimate the fabric of trust. Right? Because nowadays it's very easy to uh, deepfake, to, to synthesize um, like voices and so on uh, convincingly. Right? On this very MacBook, uh, I have uh, a local AI language model that runs in airplane mode, uh, that trains on my emails and public speeches and transcripts and so on, so much so that I can very easily reply to email now uh, by <laughs> just, just, just prompting, right, this, this digital double. And, and it has, you know, I, I don't have any issues with that because uh, I'm in the loop, right? So I, I always read it and, and change it before hitting send and I'm not sending my emails anywhere else. Uh, so I think this is uh, morally acceptable. <laughs> and, and so my, my point is um, literally like, Please write, as Audrey Tong, a compassionate, kind, and sincere reply to this email. <laughs> and then I put an email. Uh, so, um, and, and with this kind of local assistive intelligence, um, I mean, this is such a time saver <laughs> that, that I can, um, nowadays, actually not imagine writing emails without this kind of local AI. However, uh, because I'm a public figure and my transcripts are all Creative Commons Zero public domain online. So although you don't have access to all my emails, you can actually approximate something like that very easily, just using my public transcripts uh, and write something that uh, talks 
um, in a very convincing fashion like I would talk. Uh, and then um, my voice, uh, acoustic mod, of course, is generally available, right? The, the YouTube videos are ju just there. And I've even open sourced my 3D scans uh, back in 2016. So with all these components, <laughs> you can't easily be fake me. <laughs> so so the, the only thing that, that distinguish between a, um, a like locally run by myself deepfake of me and uh, deepfake that you can create probably in an afternoon uh, is actually the digital signature <laughs> of me, right? So that's the only thing that distinguishes the two. But we do not yet have very good norms, especially around emails, uh, around end-to-end -end encryption and digital signature checking. So it means that it's very easy then to mount uh, spear phishing attacks, uh, like targeted scam attacks, that usually um, you know, cost almost nothing to run and can be driven almost autonomously now, so that it's personalized persuasion instead of just broadcasting this information, it's just personalized uh, persuasion uh, at a fraction of the cost compared to one year ago. So this kind of new um, scamming friendly uh, scenario, uh, I think it's already upon us. This is some some something that we already deal with in terms of voice cloning, scammers, and so on. Uh, that's like today's problem, not tomorrow's problem. And my main worry uh, that uh, motivates me to sign a statement is that when this goes on for another year or two, uh, people will stop trusting anything that is uh, in a monitor right? or that is uh, through an intermediary. We'll go back to the time where we only trust people in the same room as people. Uh, but if we go to that point uh, in, in, in the world configuration, when the next pandemic comes, uh, when the next societal scale challenges come, we will lose the ability to coordinate as much as we did during the pandemic in the past few years. <clears throat> and that is actually an extinction risk. So this is my motivation. So I'm uh, on this spectrum, I don't actually think uh, that like tomorrow AI would just self-replicate and improve itself and become a super intelligence. Uh, but that statement unites the people who do believe that and people like me who think of this kind of second order extinction. Hope that answers the question. Yes. Uh, if you... oh, that's... I guess, uh, given that we're in this era uh, where the AI is good enough to do these deep fakes, but we haven't adopted um, norms around verification, um, why do you release so much data about yourself, uh, knowing the risk, and would you recommend other public figures do the same, given what we're facing right now? Yeah, um, I, I happen to believe that uh, low toxicity um, virus is a good uh, inoculation <laughs> against higher toxicity virus in the future. Uh, and this is also why I uh, encourage so much research around open source models. Of course, there's always the risk that those models, uh, uncensored as it were, uh, will be used for scamming and things like that. But this is exactly like applied cryptography around the turn of the century, right? If you ban it uh, from exporting and so on, only the bad people end up using cryptography. <laughs> and the society would not have the, the capacity to build better cryptography uh, solutions. So, um, so two, uh, two answers to your question. First is that I believe in the power of the commons. Uh, when people do have access to those data, I believe that uh, people who see those dangers more clearly, because it's more pervasive now, are more motivated uh, to create clarity, uh, urgent clarity around this kind of issues compared to if we just embargo all this, uh, but then the bad actors already have access in a clandestine way anyway uh, to those uh, data, and therefore they can do convincing defects before the society wakes up to the fact <clears throat> that's very easy to defake. And it's to this end that a few years ago, uh, I worked with the Board of Science and Technology here in Taiwan to create a defake video of, of me, really, uh, that talks about defects <laughs> to the people and so on. So it's kind of public vaccination. Right? So to say, uh, it's now very easy to create uh, it uh, on a phone or a laptop and so on. And so uh, I think that inoculates the people against the immediate danger, which is synthesized political speech. But it, of course, doesn't uh, fully guard against uh, targeted spear phishing and so on. But I think uh, still uh, releasing those open source models and so on is a necessary step towards building the public defense, uh, the inoculation against this threat. So that's the first thing. Um, and the second thing, I think, is um, I, I think it's easier, actually, if we uh, spend time working with people who voluntarily give out uh, such data 
as opposed to just simply you know use those data that's not for machine training purposes uh, and just divert them uh, into something that's outside of their original purpose. Uh, because um, this part, if you as a machine training uh, expert write to me and say, oh, your say a transcript, which is in Markdown, which is on GitHub, it's very good, but I noticed that there is this um, missing metadata or whatever, <coughs> then I'm motivated. <coughs> to fix my data so that it has better quality to the kind of research you're doing. But if you're, uh, you know, uh, siphoning, right, you get those data from <coughs> like passive surveillance or whatever uh, of the data that was not originally meant to be used for machine training purposes, then the kind of bias and the kind of missing metadata and the kind of data quality issues, well, you're not working with a co-producer, not a co-creator, and they have no incentive at all actually to improve the data quality, which makes this kind of uh, feedback between the machine training and the data providers much more tenuous. So I do believe in data altruism, meaning that people who voluntarily donate the data for this in exchange for a like open source or publicly released model that can actually improve people's lives. And so like both sides have to do something. And when both sides have to do something on the common good, I do believe that this creates a much more uh, powerful uh, incentive model for the public uh, common good as opposed to the adversarial case where people, you know, who are scamming or whatever, uh, earns everything uh, by you know training a machine learning model of me, and I don't even know that they exist. Hope that answers your question. Uh, okay. Hi. Um, on the topic of AI, I think there's a perspective that um, once uh, the AI, more AI gets into the labor force, it would disproportionately benefit corporations and the top one percent individual. Well, each like common person probably like will take a higher minimal wage like salary and live a comfortable life. Um, I think because like AI is inherently more, I guess stable and scalable, um, it will like create an exponential benefit to you know like the larger players. I'm wondering if you resonate with this argument and if there's anything uh, like policy wise we can do to ex mitigate this social effect while we uh, take advantage of uh, GAI uh, investments. Yeah, <clears throat> that was uh, the original motivation uh, when I, around the time I was born uh, for personal computing. Right? Because personal computing, before personal computers, we have a very similar situation with mainframes and terminals. Uh, and usually only the largest organization can afford such computing uh, apparatus and everybody are just you know, the data entry people <laughs> to those large uh, mainframes and uh, programmers that can program uh, those mainframes are uh, elites, right? And, and there's already at the time talks uh, about how you will just disrupt the economy and um, create imbalance. But then uh, comes around this idea of just personal computing. And personal computing started with a very different premise. Instead of aggregating all the data in the same place and do like cloud scale computation over it, uh, it just uh, empowers people to do like VC calc, right? Lotus 1, 2, 3 spreadsheets, uh, word processing, and so on, which uh, amplifies their own uh, needs in the direction that they're going. Uh, and with spreadsheets uh, comes a new generation of programmers that can write formulas, right? So <clears throat> it creates, as I mentioned, a layer of expertise. You don't have to like memorize COBOL or Fortran uh, in order to create a spreadsheet template that benefits you and your colleagues or your family and so on. And so that spreads the benefit of computers to the, the people closer to the pain. And then comes the internet where people can share those spreadsheet formulas uh, online. So this talks about a like collaboratively diverse vision of computation uh, that empowers people according to their own need, their communal need, uh, or the need of uh, a smaller jurisdiction, whereas this uh, like very largest computing, uh, monopolized by a monoculture, um, is a, a very different vision. And, and I think there's still sufficient uh, support in the decentralized uh, personal computing vision in the policymakers, not just in Taiwan, but in most liberal democracies uh, that can support meaningful access like this. So 
As I mentioned, the bedrock policies like universal broadband access, competency in education, maker education, and things like that, all these are just building blocks, but I think AI is not that different. I have every faith in the TSMC <laughs> uh, that uh, can power the AMD and NVIDIA GPUs, so that um, if I can run this on my MacBook now, uh, similar levels of computation will be generally available to classrooms within the next year or two, uh, and so that you can do meaningful training and inference instead of just inference only at this moment uh, at any scale of the jurisdiction, uh, district, or education facilities, and with that comes, you will probably see the same personal computing dynamic that shifts the power away from the centralized models to those more communal models. And we're um, helping, I guess. Taiwan is training the Tai the, the trustworthy uh, AI dialogue engine on top of like Open Llama or some other open source Apache licensed uh, language models to take care of our 20 national languages uh, and also to empower them with the insights from the language community so that the people in each language community can still those language models uh, to reduce the epistemic injustice created by the current generation of very large models. Uh, and because it's open source and it's, I think, starts at 7 billion, which means any computer with 4 gigabytes of uh, RAM can run it in a quantized way, uh, which is all laptops here, right? So, so I think this um, will speed up the kind of democratization of AI use. Now, the democratization of AI governance is another thing altogether, uh, but uh, governance, democratized governance, can only build upon the fact that everybody can actually participate in the use of such AI models. So we will first democratize use and now work on the democratization of governance. Thank you. Okay, I know we have a lot of questions, um, so I'm going to move on to the next topic. If we have time at the end, we can circle back to this, because I know AI is very much on everyone's minds right now. Uh, Marsha, do you want to ask this question? Um, okay. Uh, first, I think this is so cool. I, I would love to bring something like Vitae Taiwan to Spain. Um, but my question is around uh, your experience as like the youngest appointed uh, minister and first trans minister in Taiwan. Uh, what advice would you give young LGBT leaders in influencing companies and society? Mm -hmm. um, and then uh, sort of related question is you've mentioned a lot uh, about like the people closest to the pain. So how do we bring those voices into decision making and leadership? Great question. Um, yes, as the first openly trans minister, I think, in the world, according to Wikipedia, uh, <laughs> I, I think um, I, I think that I, I'm really bringing this non-binary thinking, this perspective, to not just gender, but also like partisan politics uh, and like languages and like everything, right? So uh, I don't, in my mind, have this idea like this party is closer to me and that political party is farther away from me. Uh, I don't have in my mind that this language community is closer to me and that language community uh, shouldn't be considered or, or, or anything like that. And I think it does stem from this non-binary thinking uh, from the gender world, but uh, applied intersectionally. Uh, and, and this is important because um, as bridge makers, if we uh, apply this kind of lens to every policy that we work with, then we, by definition, uh, are uh, credibly neutral. And credible neutrality is the institutional bedrock upon which that process like V-Taiwan is run. Right? So in any jurisdiction, if you start a V-Taiwan process uh, with only the, the endorsement from one half of the country, whether it's a language community or whether it's a political community or whether it's just you know one gender, right, and not other genders, uh, then, then you're doomed to fail because then that only creates a consensus within that sub community and has no actual bridge making power. It becomes a reinforcing force for for that kind of uh, sub community. So. In Taiwan, uh, in 2014, when we started the Taiwan process, that was our main struggle, to find an institution that is credibly neutral in the very polarized uh, political landscape back then. 
at the time, the My Angel administration was only enjoying 9% of popular approval. Right? So we, we cannot just piggyback it on the, uh, on the cabinet because it was enjoying very low levels of approval. So we in, eventually found uh, for the National Academy. Uh, and so the National Academy is above and beyond the entire cabinet. It reports directly to the president and at arm's length because of its like advanced institute of uh, learning status. And so uh, in the, around the same time, of course, uh, PTT, uh, uh, Red and Light Forum, was also enjoying a lot more popularity than uh, the communities in the private sector. Again, because it's piggybacked on the National Taiwan University, which is more credibly neutral than many of other competitors and so on. So the institutions in the social sector, uh, through credible neutrality, achieve this kind of legitimacy uh, when we hold rich making practices. And I often just remind myself that I'm non-binary in all things, <laughs> and so credibly neutral in all things as well. Now, with that said, uh, I think it's also important uh, for LGBTQ plus uh, leaders uh, to um, to just practice in this kind of mainstreaming effort ourselves, right? So I don't face uh, discrimination uh, in the cabinet for being openly trans, particularly because it's not even part of my politics, right? So so I, I'm just like normally trans. <laughs> so so it, it doesn't matter, right? If you look at my Twitter profile, uh, I said uh, my uh, pronouns are star slash star which is the, the Miami uh, protocol for whatever, right? Any and all. So, so I cannot be offended. <laughs> and that does create a problem with some language communities. Like there was a uh, interviewer, a journalist from Israel uh, who uh, want to write in Hebrew. <clears throat> in Hebrew, there is no neutral pronoun at all. Uh, it's uh, literally impossible uh, to, to write uh, any and all pronoun. And that uh, journalists end up just switching the two pronouns <laughs> throughout, which is, I guess, also very creative. So it promotes the kind of creativity when you normalize this kind of uh, conversations uh, with people, and then it's up to the people to uh, find how they want to express the interaction with you. And so you do not assume the burden of figuring out right, the, the Hebrew uh, pronouns for the, for the Israeli report. Um, just a, a bit as a follow-up, uh, so you, you mentioned that uh, being trans isn't part of your politics, but um, in, in some ways for some of us we might care about also advocating for like more inclusion and things like that, so how, how do you balance the two, like fighting for inclusion and also like fighting for your other ideas that you care about that are not related to your identity? Yeah. Um... So I think uh, by saying it's not my, of my politics, uh, I don't mean it's not part of the policies. Mm -hmm. I just mean that uh, I don't like rally uh, in, in a political way. But in everyday decisions, uh, for example, when uh, we first set up the Social Innovation Lab, uh, the headquarters of the Social Innovation, uh, um, including VTO and actually before the pandemic, they met in the Social Innovation Lab. We took the uh, previously Air Force uh, headquarters in the center of Taipei City uh, and then just revamped that military camp, uh, Air Force camp, <laughs> into Social Innovation Center. And um, in the, I think, four or five uh, deliberative workshops that we planned the meeting, um, naturally the, the issue of uh, bathroom uh, design uh, comes up. And because I'm openly trans, trans right? so people naturally uh, set this agenda just assuming in the ground floor there will be uh, a, um, a, a a restroom for uh, gender non-specificity, uh, and one for men and one for women, and one for uh, universal access, like handicapped people, uh, occupying equal area. Uh, and this turns some uh, would consider a zero-sum game into something that's a positive sum. Uh, and by taking this like gender mainstreaming and trans mainstreaming as the starting point, uh, it creates a dynamic in which people don't even debate on the necessity of four restrooms of equal size. Uh, and then people just debated on like extra um, rooms that one can uh, have for kitchens and things like that. But that was was not even questioned. Uh, compare that to uh, the like if I want to advocate for some specific position based on limited room and things like that, and that would create a polarizing <coughs> conversation. And I will no longer be credibly neutral actually if I hold that position. But because I'm credibly neutral, it actually encourages people to start from a non-positive, non-negative sum and a positive sum thinking. Thank you. Thank you.
Cool. Um, let's go to the next question. Uh, David, do you want to ask this question? Hi, Minister. So one of the founding principles of our program is that it's meant to train us to be the future leaders of the company. So I'm curious what your thoughts are on how companies like Google might better collaborate with organizations in the public sector to promote the civic priorities that, that you and like your cabinet set. What, what kind of civic priorities do you have in mind? When it goes I think it could depend on the, the public institution, um, on priorities that like you and your agenda and your platform set. Uh, so, so the question is more like, how can Google work with, uh, not just for, uh, the particular jurisdiction's uh, citizens? <clears throat> so I, I think, first of all, um, like uh, VTaiwan or Join Platform or the alignment assemblies we're running for AI and so on, this kind of processes uh, often are not considered when a company designs for like AI capability research and things like that. Right? So the most uh, I've seen on the top AI labs is that they pay to do some surveys. And, and that's it. Uh, there, there's uh, very few bits per individual when you run those surveys because the survey is not a wiki survey. So if, uh, unlike Slido, right, it would be like, I just create 10 likely questions and for you to vote on those 10 likely questions. It's not a lot of meaningful bits. Uh, and the, the sad thing is, though, it is already more bits than representative democracy, which is like three bits every four years or something uh, uploaded uh, in, in terms of voting. So um, I think Google and many uh, multinational companies already enjoys more legitimacy in many democratic societies because, in a sense, you already offer more bits uh, of input from the citizenry compared to the old democratic processes. But in jurisdiction like Taiwan or Estonia or Iceland and so on, because we've all already upgraded our democratic process to be a continuous one uh, through, as I mentioned, e-petitions, deliberative workshops, participatory budgeting, presidential hackathons, you name it. <coughs> so I think first is that Google can work with those existing um, high bandwidth democracy uh, processes uh, and just um, you know be a stakeholder on the table. Um, so currently, alignment assemblies counts, uh, I think, open air and anthropic, but if BART want to join, why not? <laughs> so this is one uh, with the existing process. But the second is that you can also advise other jurisdictions who are democratic, but do not yet have this kind of continuous democracy. So in addition to provide high bandwidth um, access or localized cloud or um, not just stationary uh, orbit access and so on, the government can also, hopefully with the help of Google and other multinationals, uh, invest in this kind of continuous democracy with the explicit um, hope that this kind of collective decision making will meaningfully affect uh, Google's decisions. Um, it could be like Google Translate honoring local languages or something like that, uh, or any of those uh, moderation policies uh, that is apply on a geofencing way, right? Or things like that. There are issues that local MPs care a lot about, and if there's not already a continuous democracy process, maybe Google can just suggest one that's uh, based on open source and say, if you run through this process, it makes it much easier for us to iterate on the product and service offerings every month or every two months, as opposed to like every four years. Hope that answer your question. Uh, I'm going to move on to the next. Sorry about that. I'm going to move to the next question because I know we have a lot of really uploaded questions sure. that are really good. Um, okay, let's go to the next one. Uh, I will ask this on behalf of anonymous. Um, so wait, 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 yeah. Oh, okay. Okay. Thank you, anonymous. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I was just too lazy to create an account. Um, but it goes to this question a little bit. Uh, it seems like the internet can go in two directions, and we're kind of at a split. It can be very, can be an extension of our real lives, right? You give your phone number to create a Twitter account. You give your real name, whatever. You give a face ID, or it can be a very anonymous world where uh, you can create a Reddit account and you can post on Reddit without anybody knowing who is behind that account. And I'm wondering, there's clear benefits to both sides. I'm wondering how you think about the internet and the future that it should be. 
that the internet is whatever the internet worked stakeholders think it should be. Uh, but as a um, as a person <laughs> that um, really s have seen a lot of asymmetric power uh, situations, I do think pseudonymity is a, a must. If you insist on uh, real offline identities, you lose a lot of the voices from people closer to the pain uh, because they're suffering from some kind of structural injustice from their employers, from their communities, and things like that. And if you insist on real name uh, for their posts uh, to appear on Slido uh, instead of anonymous, as we made a point here, <laughs> then, then uh, they simply cannot be whistleblowers. So some, so some kind of protection of the sources to journalism, I think that is the the lowest bar, like you have to at least have that. Fortunately, though, you do not have to sacrifice all the anti-spam or anti-scam technologies in order to achieve that. There are ways around zero-knowledge proofs uh, that can let people share what's called verifiable credentials. Right? People can prove uh, that they are uh, a human um, of at least 18 years old uh, and is a resident or a citizen in a certain jurisdiction without revealing any other information. All right? And the technology already exists today uh, is a W3C standard, verifiable credentials. Um, and so we are now working uh, in the W3C as the Minister of Digital Affairs uh, to work on such uh, zero-knowledge protocols. Uh, and we found that with good designed uh, zero-knowledge protocols, such as the uh, 1922 SMS contact tracing method we devised with the GovZero community during the pandemic. Like if you see a venue post a QR code, you scan it and it pops up the SMS interface to 1922, which is stored in the telecom, not the state or any commercial vendor. And you see that this is a 15-digit random number and it's actually generated, could be generated by the venue itself. Uh, then you can see clearly two things. First, the venue uh, learns nothing when you send out this SMS to 1822, uh, not even your phone number. And that the 1822 um, uh, in your telecom doesn't even know which venue you've been to because it's a randomized number. It's only when uh, contact exposure and whatever um, that needs to be activated do we actually go back and um, notify the people who are exposed um, in the same uh, vicinity and so on. So this almost uh, zero knowledge design is vastly better than the previous design, which is, I'm sorry, but Google Forms, uh, which, <laughs> which aggregates data <laughs> to the same admin and, and therefore uh, creates a, a massive uh, attack surface and uh, incentive to attack. Uh, so no matter how well designed the Google security is, there's always some way to just spare fish and, and gain the credentials of that admin, which at that time you will probably get hundreds of thousands of people's uh, personal details and so on. And so, without much need for um, convincing everybody to switch overnight to the zero knowledge uh, part because people do want to participate in contact tracing and get notified for exposure but people instinctively know that if you reveal private information in this way it will be used against you in ways that you did not anticipate and so this is not just about protecting the sources and so on it's about better hygiene, right? If you can do contact tracing without collecting private information in the venue, you should do so because it protects you against cyber attacks down the road. Um, and I think this is a much more uh, convincing uh, line of reasoning uh, that will encourage the vendors and especially small and media enterprises to adapt, adopt zero knowledge protocols. And it's our work in the ministry to create a kind of infrastructure that let people digitally sign things and so on uh, without revealing their uh, offline identities while proving that they are a human and with certain uh, characteristics to, to enter the, the multi-stakeholder conversation, for example. Um, in the joint platform, uh, we use SMS uh, to authenticate uh, people who can get 5,000 signatures because if we use email, anyone can create 5,000 email and therefore the minister will be <laughs> the, like DDoSed, right? <laughs> but but uh, we also make sure that uh, um, the uh, competent authority 
uh, doing the verification is not the same as the competent authority, the minister responds to the team. So that the minister cannot ask and say uh, who those 5,000 people are. Actually, this intermediary, uh, we design an oblivious way. So they, even if they want, they cannot uh, divulge uh, who actually passed the SMS verification. But the SMS is based on the SIM card that requires two photo IDs to obtain. So therefore, it's reasonably clone proof. Right. So I think this kind of um, like oblivious design or uh, zero knowledge design verifiable credentials um, currently is uh, not at a point where it's more convenient uh, than just simply tying it uh, to the SMS number, but it's our job to make it as convenient as the old way. And once we reach that, I think people even presented with both choices will naturally float to the zero knowledge one. So, so just to make sure I understand, you also advocate for social media companies and everything and, and uh, other software services that use this kind of zero knowledge identification method? Yes, uh, and, and the reason simply is that it's easier actually uh, for, the, for the citizens or for the users uh, to engage in a way that doesn't carry the entire surveilled uh, profile uh, with them in a space, it actually makes for more authentic uh, co-creations. Uh, because of um, the, the advance in AI, if it's not zero knowledge, but just partially de-identified, uh, anyone with some computation uh, and a good um, uh, grasp of the social graph can easily re-identify. Uh, or more conveniently said, docs, right? <laughs> Any participant uh, in the conversation, which actually derails the conversation because it enables ad hominem attacks, right? And things like that. And with language models, those ad hominem attacks, you know, doesn't even take effort to create. Uh, and, and so I think we've already uh, seen in the uh, Web3 communities, because what's on blockchain is there forever, quote unquote, uh, they already adopted uh, this kind of norms around zero knowledge knowledge, proofs, and so on, simply because on-chain governance is impossible without this kind of zero knowledge proof. So in this Web3 maximally scamming world, <laughs> there's already some norms that enables coordination across jurisdictions uh, between people who haven't met each other in person. And I think because of language models and so on, we're seeing much more of those norms just trickling down to the Web2 world, uh, which is the world we're in now, uh, that requires the same sort of uh, protections. Cool. Um, let's go to the next one. Uh, Yash, do you want to ask this question? Sure. Um, I'll make it quick. But essentially, you know, for a lot of problems, you want to collect lots, lots of stakeholders' opinions to make sure we're accounting for everything, making the right decisions. Uh, there are often issues where it's hard for the stakeholders to know the effects. Not because they don't know it, because no one knows it, right? If there's policies around, hey, we're going to create new lighting policy. Uh, we're considering all lights being mm -hmm. green. I don't particularly understand the effects of green lights on my mood, on my work. It's kind of hard to know. Uh, this is an arbitrary example. But uh, generalized, what are the mechanisms we can ensure that stakeholders are, are able to make, able to, you know, in an educated and informed way, provide opinions. And they themselves are able to account for effects um, of, of all these things that I'm getting. Yeah, this is a, a great question. Um, so we design uh, beta and inspire processes uh, using the double diamond method. I'm sure uh, all of you can memorize, right? So, um, so basically, the double diamond uh, from IDEO uh, says that before jumping to decisions, uh, which is second diamond, we need to work on the first diamond, uh, which is just to converge uh, on a set of how might we questions uh, instead of particular solutions. So settling on the rough consensus around the how might we questions is actually the goal of the police part of the VTAW process and not any of those decision making or binding processes. Um, but for the discover part uh, of the first diamond, it makes sense to just discover the feelings because everyone is very informed about their feelings. Uh, it's less likely uh, to, to be inauthentic if you simply ask, how do you feel uh, about something? 
And it also helps to uh, make that something easily relatable. So like during the UberX conversation, we didn't say, how do you feel about the sharing economy? Uh, that, that doesn't work, right? People would simply protest. This is the gig economy, the extractive economy. This is not the sharing economy, and then we get nowhere. Right? So, so we instead asked, uh, so there are people who have driver's license but not professional driver licenses on their way to work or whatever. They pick up strangers, they met through an app and charging them for it. Uh, how do you feel about this? Right? So, so basically we're, we're taking something very specific. The theoretical term is called overlapping consensus. The, the kind of very specific circumstances that is new to the society yet very easily relatable and then simply ask how do you feel about it. And so the resonance right, the, in the um, clusters created by polis become less like an ideological uh, polarization, but more like uh, I have this feeling around this, I have feelings around hope and feelings around fear and, and so on, which makes it actually much easier than to find rough consensus because people can't change their feelings after they reflect on things, but it's hard to change their terms, like right? sharing economy versus geek economy, even after reflecting uh, on the group's uh, collective intelligence. So by focusing uh, on the uh, reflective part, the feeling part, it's easier then for the discover part to converge into the defined part. And once we even make a little bit of headway into the defined part for the uh, bridging narratives, it quickly converges uh, to uh, how might we, because then the collective intelligence rocks uh, the wicked problem and then just start finding uh, bridges and pathways through it, usually by the second or the third week of the police conversation. Um, and there's a method called uh, focus conversation method, uh, the ORID method, that talks about this in, in length uh, and dynamic facilitation and so on. So in a sense, we're just uh, doing asynchronously what the uh, facilitators of focus conversation method and dynamic facilitation have already known for ages. Like if in an open space technology situation, you want to have the crowd converge on something that is more definable as how might we, this is the kind of questions like you ask, you ask uh, what's the kind of feelings that we, we can resonate with, what is the world in the possible worlds that we can live in, that we can live with, but you don't ask what's the perfect solution or what's the technical definition of this uh, phenomenon. I hope that answers your question. Um, I, I don't know if you have anything afterwards, I can be here all day. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, okay, uh, here. Thank you. So, across many democracies, there is a growing um, distrust in the process of democracy. Uh, so, for example, many voter turnouts are record low, and there is a feeling that governments ask us questions but don't listen to us in the process. And so, what I'm wondering is how important is for you the communication piece surrounding the process of decision and how you tell the public that their opinion was heard and used in the process, but it may not go in the direction that they had hoped. Mm -hmm. So essentially two questions, right? So um, I'll, I'll answer first the first one. Um, how do we design the interaction such that people feel they're responding to in the here and now instead of some indeterminable point in the future, right? So this is the first part of the question. Um, so, as I mentioned, I think uh, things like Slido or Polis or any other technologies or ideas and so on um, have this property in that even though the authorities did not immediately answer to a group consensus, the group that participated learned something about itself that is insightful and new and not something that you would discover simply by talking to your tribe, right? So the possibility of bridging statements is pedagogical in itself. Uh, and we need to design the spaces such that these bridging narratives easily become the first thing that people see uh, when they enter an ongoing conversation. And so people immediately feel that, oh, I'm part of a larger something now, uh, simply by entering this pro-social space. And that is value in itself. It's uh, conveyed in the here and now, because then you can easily mobilize many people in Taiwan before starting a national referendum, first start a petition. 
because it enabled them to find the 5,000 people that will form the core canvassing group right, for the national uh, scale um, deliberation and referenda. If you, they, they just jump to the referenda, it's less likely for them to collect, the, I think, 200,000 or something signatures. But if you go through this uh, online deliberation uh, process of space, it's much easier to just adjust your messages according to the bridging statements and collect uh, the help you need to uh, get into a national um, referendum. So this is the first thing. Uh, and the second part of the question is more like how to increase the political commitment uh, on the result. Uh, actually, just by projecting this back, it becomes almost impossible for me to ignore the issues on Slido, right? And even if I delegated my moderation powers, <laughs> still the moderator will have to say, well, there's actually something with 14 votes, maybe let's move on to that, right? So it, it creates a, a, a very high legitimacy if you know in a 23 million jurisdiction, there's like 10,000 people who feel passionate about it, uh, and you probably have to respond in a here and now, and if you don't, as a cabinet minister, there are MPs that will respond to them. There are city councilors that will respond to them because it's in their benefit uh, to do so, because if they know that there is a bridge narrative, the people have already co-created a prototype of the solution, and the national cabinet did not yet answer to that, it will actually massively increase any MPs vote simply by adopting that rough consensus as a platform. So uh, I think we our processes are complementary to representative democracy. So instead of just asking people to turn out on a like once every four year vote, we basically just vote every day. Uh, and uh, it, even if only a small fraction of population engage in any particular a petition. Uh, taken uh, as a whole, um, it routinely every year engage more than half uh, of our uh, citizenry. So that's like 10 million people. Uh, most of them just look at one petition uh, and just sign on that petition because their friends and family ask them to or whatever. But it doesn't matter because they know that there is a pro-social space that they can go to and that increase the institutional trust because we first trust the people to set the agenda. So even if only half a population trust back, it is a net win for democracy. Well, uh, let's go to Dana's question around uh, job description one. Okay. Um, uh, and we can also combine that with the first anonymous question yes. around transitioning to political space. I see. The pressure of the vote. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'll you. Okay. Very grateful for you being here. Thank you very much for your time. You were asked to write your own job description, and I guess I would love to ask how you decided what to include and exclude. And maybe as a quick follow-up, as the first minister of that, you know, time once you having an education and competence in study literacy and living in an open source world, how will they kind of inherit this world they grow into and with you know that in mind, both in the open source world and the need to be cyber secure and to have, you know, uh, digital signatures. Okay. Great. Uh, well, I, I trust that you've probably seen my job description, uh, mm -hmm. but just just as a reminder. <laughs> um, so my job description is pinned on my Twitter so that I don't forget it. <laughs> okay. Um, so, and it, it goes like this. Uh, when we see Internet of Things, let's make it an Internet of Beings. When we see virtual reality, let's make it a shared reality. When we see machine learning, let's make it collective learning. When we see user experience, let's make it about human experience. And whenever we hear the singularity is near, let's remember the plurality is here. Um, so I make sure to exclude the, the left part, <laughs> the, the quoted part, uh, and include uh, the parts that's not quoted, the Internet of Beings, Shared Reality, Collective Learning, Human Experience, and Plurality. Uh, and uh, I, I think it, this is not a conscious design. This is not a process that I plan on a piece of A4 paper or post-it notes. This is literally just something that occurred to me uh, that um, arrived to me uh, when I was in New Zealand for the OSOS uh, NZ conference and I was just in the beginning of that conference there was some Maori dancing and chanting and whatever and it just dawned upon me this, this whole thing so it's not me that made the process <laughs> that it is just whatever it's uh, what was there that, that made it um, or as uh, Socrates would say, a, a spirit, a demon mate. Uh, <laughs> um, right. um, 
and oh, we say A, right? D A E and all. Uh, so uh, and uh, um, oops, and now we've lost the projection. Uh, here we go. So yes. So uh, as of the the other parts, uh, I think yeah, it's there. Yeah. So um, oh, maybe the spirit wants us to. Okay, okay. <laughs> to dwell on the poem a little bit more. Yeah, so, okay. so as for the second part of the question, um, I, I think the, the idea of plurality is to refuse to buy into any dilemma thinking, like whether uh, you know, open source uh, participatory access is inherently a dilemma vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, security or safety. Uh, and, and or, uh, as some other questions uh, have said uh, before, uh, whether uh, innovation or progress is somehow um, inherently in a dilemma vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, public participation or innovation vis-a-vis -vis safety. Right? So, so the, the trilemma really uh, around participation, safety, and progress uh, is the, the founding model of my ministry. Uh, the, the Ministry of Digital Affairs uh, have the departments of Democracy Network, Plural Innovation, uh, Digital Service, and so on, all uh, like laser focused on the participation as a value. But under the MODA, there are two administrations for cybersecurity and digital industries, respectively, uh, that focuses on safety and, and progress. And the basic idea of plurality is that if you engage the collective intelligence, it's always possible to find an overlapping consensus that take care of all three values at once, uh, instead of having to arbitrarily choose between the dilemmas. So basically, it's more like suspending judgment, like reading a book. Right? If you absorb the whole context, then the overlapping consensus emerges. But if you start debating based on one side of the trilemma triangle, then it's always like possible to just quickly earn some local optimization on, on a particular uh, side of a triangle to the detriment, to the sacrifice of the other parts of the triangle. So um, I think part of the poem, the prayer, my job description, uh, is just to constantly remind people that such overlaps exist. Uh, but if you over fixate on the quoted terms on the left side, all of them assume a particular viewpoint on progress that makes this kind of trilemma solving almost impossible. Hope that answer the question. Okay, thank you so much, Minister. So um, this has been a really great discussion. Um, we're all very thankful. I know we have a lot of other questions, uh, but we actually we have a reservation at 12 p.m. Unfortunately, that we have to get uh, going to. We would love to continue this conversation, though. Um, thank you so much for coming and speaking to us. Thank you.